Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we continue our series called Backstory. The idea being beyond, behind uh, the, our stories, if you will, is, is a greater story. A story that, that uh, uh, are, are the, the, the stories that we live kind of point to that story. And, and this backstory, if we think about it, informs our existence. Uh, and, and so we continue this. We started this last week, and we continue this. And, and today we're going to look at, at this backstory and, and these points in it anticipation, pursuit, and sacrifice. Anticipation, pursuit, and sacrifice, uh, d- dear Christian friends. In a little paragraph that I wrote, uh, kind of uh, to, to get us into this study, in, in, in the trifold, kind of a, a, a little taste of what we're going to talk about, I, I, I mentioned radio telescopes. I don't know if you read that or not, and, and you know, we have built uh, these huge, massive radio telescopes uh, that, that uh, for millions and millions of dollars, and, and they're pointed to outer space, and they have, they have one function, okay? And that one function is to, is to take radio signals and send them into outer space and to listen to see if we get anything back, right? Their one function is to search the universe for intelligent life. And I, I find that amazing that, uh, that we as a people, the whole human race, has this, such this, this great need uh, uh, to, to, to discover someone out there so that we're not alone. huh? Because I, I think that's what we're crying out. Are we all alone here? Why would we have that need? I think last week we kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, we would have that need because we know things are broken, right? So we talked about last week that everyone seems to know things are broken. You can talk to somebody in China, somebody in Russia, somebody uh, in, in Europe, somebody in America, and everybody knows things aren't right. You might have different ideas about just what is wrong <laughs> and just how to fix things, Right? But no one thinks everything is okay. We all share that brokenness in in our stories. Uh, We looked last week at at this eternal oughtness idea. Dr. Martin Luther King talked about the eternal oughtness. That is, that every single human being knows that things are not how they ought to be. Does that connect with you? I think maybe that's one reason why we have these radio telescopes, huh? Help us! Things aren't the way they should be. We can't do it ourselves. Please, somebody be out there for us. We don't want to be all alone because things aren't right, huh? It's amazing that the Bible reflects these realities. That's what we looked at last week. The Bible says that things are broken, that things are not how they ought to be. The Bible looks at us. Go ahead, Tom, put that next one up for me. The Bible looks at us and it says to us, we're not what we should be. Of course, we know that, right? Are you everything you want to be? You got it all together? (laughs) I don't. We, We share that, don't we? None of us is what we think we ought to be. And we also share the, the idea that I said that things aren't the way they should be. And we look everywhere for, for help, huh? But it never seems to be enough, and so we put radio telescopes up, say, come and help us. <laughs> Last week, we summed this up in this paragraph. Go ahead, Tom. If this account is true, it should seem intuitive. It, it should seem, have the ring of truth inside of us, huh? We should sense that God is there but distant from us, that the world is not as it ought to be, that, the evil, that evil pollutes our thoughts and actions, and that the pursuit of redemption is universal. That's what we're going to look at today. We're going to focus on this idea that the pursuit of redemption, of making things right, somehow wanting to fix things, is universal. It's been there through every generation of humankind. It it fills up our thoughts. It's part of our psyche. We want to fix things. We want to get things right, huh? That's what we're going to look at today. As I thought about this, um, I thought about the stories of humankind, the ancient stories that come from India uh, and China and, and Greece. 
You know those stories that, 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 that says that there were these heroes, huh? The stories, all, all we, they, they, they talk about these heroes that are raised up. Hercules, right? Herc, he's going to fix things. He's going to help humankind, right? But in every story, even though they may do some wonderful things, they always miss the mark. They always fall short. That's why, at least with the Greek stories, they're called tragedies. Tragedies. And if they're not tragedies, they end like this, and they all live happily ever, and we call them fairy tales. We know they're not right. Huh? We know they're make-believe. And, and we see these, these stories all, all, all through history. King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Camelot, huh? You know, they were real historical figures. But whatever they did back there, it just didn't last, did it? Kind of tragic figures, huh? Another tragedy? Beauty and the Beast. Things aren't what they should be, right? Humankind in Beauty and the Beast, they're reduced to forks and knives, and dogs are, 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 are reduced to those little credenzas that you put your feet on, right? Humankind's reduced to teacups and, and, and teapots. And the one person who is still kind of human, he's a beast. And it says there's a curse on all of them. And the hero makes everything right. But of course, that story ends, and they lived happily ever so we know that story isn't true either. These stories of redemption are, are found in every culture and in every age. They're part of our human psyche, if you will. We, we can't get away from them. And we're always looking for these stories. We're always writing these stories. Superman, huh? There's another one. We're always seeing and looking at these stories. Do you think maybe just perhaps that idea was somehow put inside of us to point to a story that is true? To point to a story that's not a tragedy and not a fairy tale? The one story of redemption that is true That's the story that the Bible tells us about. Today we're going to look at that story. We're going to look at it un, un, under three themes, if you will. Okay. Um, the first theme is anticipation. And the second theme is pursuit. And the last theme is sacrifice. Would you say those with me? I'll say each one, then you say it. Anticipation. Pursuit. Sacrifice. Anticipation. In your little booklet on page 03, it has these words. Is there any hope? Actually, yes. Though we betrayed God, he did not abandon us. Through the prophets, God promised to send a Savior who would restore, who would res restore and rescue us from the consequences of our sin and betrayal. Anticipation. It seems to be built into our existence. We all anticipate that things will be better tomorrow. We, we write these stories as humankind. We write these stories of heroes that will come and make things better. We always hope for more. We even write a, a, of a perfect thing called utopia. Huh? In the Bible, God talks to us about a story that will come true in his son. And the Old Testament is all about anticipating this story from the very beginning. Now, now picture this scene with me, okay? You have Adam and Eve, and they've just blown it. We talked about that last time. It, it, was, it was really a thing of betrayal, all right? They, they had this relationship with God, and, and, and they, 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 they walked away from that relationship. It had nothing to do with eating fruit. It had everything to do with walking away from relationship. Uh, we, we talked about how we, we see that in our everyday lives, how things that from the outside might look to be real little 
can really cut and hurt in a relationship, can become a mountain in a relationship and put a big wall between you. They listened to somebody else. They turned away from that relationship and they no longer were filled up in who they were in God. And God comes to them and they're frightened and, and they know that nothing will ever be right again. And he turns to the serpent who had been taken over by Satan and he says, someone's going to come, serpent. Someone's going to come, Satan, who's going to crush your head. Anticipation. And the whole Old Testament, and really the whole Bible, we'll talk about that as we go along here, but the whole Old Testament is about anticipating what God will do. In fact, when, when Eve had her firstborn child, Cain, the, he, the Hebrew, don't, I love this, by the way. Please, I, I think this is just awesome. This is life over here, these kids over here, right? That's awesome. I'm glad they're making all that noise, okay? We'll just, we'll just admit that that noise is there, and we'll say, woo-hoo, they're learning about Jesus, okay? That's okay. So we're, we're, we're going to go on now, all right? We, this is awesome stuff. We'll, we'll let that go on. Uh, and, and anticipation. Uh, Eve, Eve has her firstborn, and she says, I have a son, the Lord. That's what it says in the Hebrew. I have a son, the Lord. It's very, very obvious that Eve thinks that this firstborn son is the one that's going to come and crush the head of the serpent, right? The seed of the woman's going to crush the head of the serpent. This has got to be the one. This must be the Lord. Of course, it wasn't, huh? And as history unveils, we see God saying to Abraham, Abraham, I'm, I'm, choosing, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to make a nation of you. And out of you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. You see the promise there? You see the anticipation? And from this, this people of Abraham, who, who then a few generations had 12 sons and 12 tribes, from that tri would be Judah, from the house of Judah. And then from the, from the seed of David. He's promising. He's anticipating. He wants us to anticipate. And even in, in, in the Old Testament text, you see um, again and again, you see stories of what that will mean for us. God comes to the children of Israel in slavery and death in Egypt, and he rescues them. Over and over again are these stories of rescue, of these stories of, of uh, champions being raised up by God who comes to his people and rescues them. That's what we're looking for as a human race, Right? And God again and again says, I'm the one. Anticipate it. I'm the one. There's a wonderful story uh, that, uh, that, that I think about when I talk about this. It's, it's, there's a woman named Hannah, and, and she, she's childless, uh, which means she's very looked down in that culture. And, and, and she comes to the prophet, and, or she comes to the, the, the temple, and, and she's saying, please give me a child. And God hears her voice, and she has Samuel. Again and again, we see these stories played out for people who cannot help themselves. God comes and helps them. We see these, these prophecies of Jesus. Isaiah 53, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Psalm 22, which is a perfect picture of the cross before anyone had ever been uh, executed by the use of a cross. Over and over and over again, God paints the picture for us. God tells us it's coming. In the midst of all this, he leaves, he leaves these supernatural prints of authenticity. Things you can't miss. That this Savior, 700, I'm sorry, 700 years before he was born, the text says he would be born in a little, little village called Bethlehem. Isn't that amazing? 700 years before he was born, that he would be born of a virgin. There are over 90 of these specific messianic prophecies, all written centuries before Jesus, and Jesus alone fits the bill. Some of you ha have heard, me, have heard uh, this, this before, but uh, it fits so beautifully. Let, let, let me uh, uh, share it again with you. I, the very first Hebrew teacher that I had, a uh, Hebrew professor uh, in college, uh, she, she, was an Orthodox, she had been an Orthodox Jew, which means that a Jew that, that, that is, really practices Judaism, right, and is really into the text. And she was going to get married 
to a man who, uh, who was a Christian, uh, but, but didn't practice as much as he should have, all right? And she said, well, of course, you'll become a Jew. A- and he said to her, you know, I-, I know maybe I'm not what I should be as far as a Christian, but I'm telling you, at the end of the day, I look to Jesus Christ as my Savior. And, 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 I, and I'm, every day, I, w- I want to live more as, as, as Jesus would have me live. I can't walk away from Jesus. And so she made it her business to get into the Old Testament text and prove that Jesus could not possibly have been the Messiah. And she proved just the opposite. In fact, she was so frustrated, she brought, um, I didn't know these guys, uh, occur- I didn't know they were there until she told me about them, but they have things called rabbi deprogrammers. <laughs> she called the rabbi deprogrammers. And she said, please, please show me I'm wrong. And she kept asking questions of them because she wanted to be shown that she was wrong. And finally they told her, you got to quit asking questions. You're cursed. They couldn't answer her questions, though. And through all that, the Spirit of God, through these prophecies, brought her into a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a text in 2 Peter. It, it, the, the, uh, P- Peter writes uh, under the auspice of the Holy Spirit. He writes that all these ancient prophecies, they were not written for the sake of those who wrote them, but they were written for our sakes, those who are living now, that we can look back and see the very stamp of God through these prophecies. Put the next one up. In your booklet, it sums it up like this. The prophets were God's messengers through whom he promised a future deliverer, a Messiah. Their message preserved in Jewish scripture was validated as their many predictions came true. Anticipation. It's part, it's part of our common story. It makes sense that the true story of redemption have this huge slice of anticipation pointing towards the one who is the Messiah, the one who was sent to redeem us, to make things right. Anticipation. Second word that we want to look at today is pursuit. Okay, pursuit. In, in your booklets, uh, it, it's on page 04 and, and the next page next to 04 plus. Pursuit. You know what pursuit means? It means that somebody comes after you. All right? It, it, it means that you're going the wrong direction, so somebody has to grab you and, 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 and pull you back. I remember uh, I, when I was young, I was a sleepwalker. Any of you guys are sleepwalkers? I'm curious. Okay, I, I did, and a sleep roller. I remember one time we were uh, in a national uh, park, and, and my brother and I were asleep in a pup tent. We didn't have a floor to it. And, and I rolled like 150 yards and ended up in the middle of the highway on the double yellow line. I'll never forget that because my brother came and woke me up. He pursued me. All right, and by the way, somebody thinks I always make these, these stories up. I'm not making this up at all. Happened in Missouri, honest, right? And, and, and my brother came, he, he, in the middle of the night, he, he says I'm not there, and he goes down, and he says, Brad, you're right, and I remember when he woke me up, I'm looking at the double yellow line. All right? I had no idea I was sleeping on a double yellow line. All right? He pursued me. He came after me. Because I didn't even know where I was or where I had to go. We need to be pursued after because we're in the same place. We don't know how to get to where we need to go. In fact, we're even dead to the idea that we need to go somewhere. We just know things are wrong. That's why Jesus came. He, he stepped into our world. He pursued us. When you look at the common story we share of a broken world and a broken existence and not and looking to outer space for help, for goodness sakes, does it make sense that the true story of redemption is someone coming to us. Someone pursuing us. There's this uh, paragraph, this little booklet, it goes like this. As promised, God sent the one who would rescue and restore us. 
His name was Jesus. The unique, one and only Son of God became one of us. He spoke truth, modeled love, dispensed grace, granted forgiveness, and offered life in all of its fullness. The concept of Messiah differs from that of a prophet, mystic, or sage. Messiah is humanity's deliverer, the go-between or bridge between God and man. You know, think about all the redemptive stories with me. Is there any other story that doesn't ask you to make yourself better? Is there any other story that doesn't ask humankind to somehow claw its way up to God? To come to a new place where you're enlightened? Tell me, you think you can get there? And in the midst of all those stories, there's one. There's one story that's different. It says that God comes to us in Jesus to do what we could not. Which one has the ring of truth to you? Put the next one up for me, Tom. In claiming to be the Messiah, Jesus claimed forgiveness for the fallen. You get that? He doesn't ask you to be better and fix things. He comes to you and forgives you. Have you ever um, had a, a relationship close to your heart break? The only thing that can fix it is forgiveness. Is that right? You can't go back and redo, can you? You got no redos. Jesus came to bring us together with God again. He forgives us. He doesn't say, make yourself better. And then he comes to restore those things that are not right. His spirit <laughs> comes into our hearts and souls begins to do its work within us. And we have these wonderful promises of anticipation that when Jesus comes in all of his glory, he's going to restore all things, make all things new. Huh? New heavens and a new earth. Just the way it was meant to be. And in Jesus we see absolute certainty because there's nobody like him. There's nobody like him. It smacks of truth. So we have anticipation, we have pursuit. Uh, put, put the next one up for me, Tom. And we have sacrifice. You know, our world kind of runs on sacrifice. I was talking with somebody just, just before the service today, and, and he was talking about the, uh, his college classes all went very well. And, and we were talking about the fact that he had to put in a bunch of time and a bunch of work in order for those classes to go very well. That's the way it is, Right? If you don't put in the sacrifice, you're not going to get what you need. That's just the way it is. Life runs that way. Isn't that right? We say to our kids all the time, hey, you want to accomplish this? This is what you got to do. The Rocky movies, right? You know, one, two, three, four. Dun, 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 dun. What is he doing in the beginning of each movie? He's doing one-arm push-ups. He's jumping rope. He's, ch he's chasing the chicken. Why is he doing all that stuff? Unless he puts in the sacrifice, unless he puts in the time. That's how every story goes, right? That's the way our life is. Unless you put in the sacrifice, you put in the time, you're not going to achieve what you need. But what if there's something that no matter how much you sacrifice, no matter how much you work, you just can't possibly achieve it. What do you do then? You need a hero. You need a champion. You need a savior who will step into the gap and who will pay your sacrifice 
for you. That's what Jesus did. In your booklet, it has these words, life's greatest mystery was revealed in love's greatest act. Jesus, the author of life, died for us, taking upon himself our guilt and atoning for our sin. How can we be sure? God raised Jesus from the dead, the imprimatur. He is alive today and offers life to all who would receive it. Christ died for our sins once for all time, the just dying for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. There's this word called grace. It means, it means that we undeservedly receive what someone else has done, that we are undeservedly loved. There's a Christian uh, uh, a contemporary artist, and, and th th this is what they wrote concerning grace. Go ahead, put that up top. And yet along comes this idea called grace. Would you read this with me? Love interrupts the consequences of your actions. The point of the death of Christ is that Christ took on the sins of the world so that what we put out did not come back to us. That's the point. That's grace. Does it make sense that it has to be about grace if the story of redemption would be true? Does it make sense that, we, <laughs> that, that we're just stuck? We can't fix things? As you see thousands of years of human history, what do you think? As you see the time in which you live, what do you think? You think we can do it? You think all those stories somehow are about humankind overcoming? Or are they all tragedies for a reason? Or fairy tales? The one true story of redemption is the story of grace. <laughs> it's got to be. It's the only thing that makes sense. Put the next one up, Tom. Jesus' death is the ultimate demonstration of God's love. He took upon himself the pain, guilt, death, and condemnation of our sin and betrayal in order to restore a relationship that we have rejected. This isn't about objective reality. It's about Jesus coming to you in this moment with this objective truth. Personally touching your hearts with this reality that in our brokenness, Jesus would come and connect us anew to God. That Jesus is coming again to restore all things. And we can know that he keeps his promises because we see the cross and the empty tomb. Go to the last one for me, Tom. Backstory. Anticipation. Pursuit. Sacrifice. Where do you need to remember those things in your life? That God keeps his promises. That God loves you so much that he pursues you every day with his love and with the Savior. And that no matter what it took, no matter what the sacrifice, Jesus gave it up for you. That you might have life the way it was meant to be. And one day, all things might be restored in the world that was meant to be. Who do you know that needs to hear these things? Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith to life never ending. Amen.